Some of you have been uh, out of university for some time. Uh, Casey was my student two years ago. So I'm going to start with the quiz, because uh, you know, just to give you into the right state of mind. And I'm going to show you seven pictures. And I'm going to ask you what's common to all seven. And these are pretty diverse pictures. So here we go. Here's the first one. So just look carefully at what it is. You don't need to give me an answer right now. This is the second one. This is the third one. This is the fourth one. There's five, there's six, and seven. All right, so I'll do it again slowly, a little bit, just because you guys look all totally bewildered. You're supposed to be Google people, smart guys, so figure it out. Here's number one. Here's number two. Number three. Here's number four. Here's five, here's six, and here is seven. So any, <laughs> anybody want to try, take a guess at what it is? Yeah, sorry, you missed the quiz. <laughs> You'll have to ask your friends later. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> if it's my quiz, it's possible, yeah. So any, anybody want to try? So I'll tell you, I'll give, put names to it. So that's an that's a avalanche. That's the Berlin Wall, you know that. That's the uh, Xerox Alto, the first PC. This is uh, Len Kleinrock with the INP, which was the first node in the ARPANET in 1969. This is a map of the Balkans in, just before World War I. This is, well, Das Kapital by Karl Marx. And that's a boy plugging a dike in Holland. It's a sculpture of a boy plugging a dike in, 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 in the Netherlands. Yeah, it's a sculpture. It's a famous story about uh, Hans Brinker, this guy who put a thumb in the dike to prevent it from uh, collapsing. So, OK, so. It's just before a major tipping point. There you go. Now you know why he's the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so, so these are all things that happen just before a tipping point. To go back to the beginning, uh, this is just before the dike broke. You know, this guy was kind of, the, 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 you put your finger in because if you let go, the whole dike was going to collapse. This set off the communist revolution, enough said. This is the powder keg of Europe, the Balkans before uh, the World War I. One assassination in Sarajevo in 1914 caused, you know, seven years of misery to millions of people in Europe. This is the beginning of the internet, the first node, the internet message processor, and somehow, you know, in 40 years, you cannot build the entire internet infrastructure. This started the PC revolution. This was the Xerox Alto, which had WYSIWYG, the WIMP interface, you know, windows, icons, mouse, pointers. And this is the Berlin Wall, rearranged the map of Europe. And this re may rearrange your face if you get caught in it. <laughs> so What's important about all of these, what's interesting is that this is what it looks like. Basically, this is accumulation of energy or potential inside the system, OK? And it reaches this crux. And at some point, a small push, the straw that broke the camel's back, is going to cause an energy minimization with a large release of energy. You can call this equivalent of nuclear fission, if you want, or all of these other things. They all have this notion of ingrained concentrated large energy, which is then being pushed over. And my analysis is that there are actually three things going on. There's this notion of internal contradictions. You know, Marx talked about the internal contradictions of capitalist society. And uh, similarly, in a dike, you know, the dike is keeping the water mass away. You know, the Berlin Wall was, was separating a nation which was artificially split. OK, so in all these cases, an internal contradiction Plus, there are external pressures. There's some external pressure which comes from wherever. And adding to these two is a technological push. There is something that extra technology that causes the whole thing to basically fall apart. So what I'm going to argue is the electrical grid has reached this. Okay, And I'm going to now ask you to hold this thought in your mind for just a few minutes while I tell you what the grid is, and then I'll come back to this, explain to you why I think there's going to be a major change. So let's start. What is the grid like? So this is like a you know idiot's guide to the electrical grid. And what we have is basically on the left, on the on my left, yeah, on the left hand side, we have sources of production. So we have coal, so dominant source of production. We have nuclear 
and we have hydroelectric. These are dominant sources of production pretty much in any country. You can also add in you know, other things like natural gas and so on, which I haven't really shown. The second component is called transmission. That's all the wires that you see over here all over the place, transmission. And these are long, long distance. And then finally, we have distribution, where the distribution corresponds to basically is a substation that blocks over there, and then the wires going out to each house, that's distribution. And those are the three components of any electrical generation system, okay? Generation, transmission, and distribution. Now, the problems and the inter inherent contradictions and external pressures are apparent from this beautiful figure, which comes from the Lawrence Livermore National Lab in the US, and it shows in 2008, how much energy was used in quadrillion BTUs, uh, called quads. Uh, and you can see that it's a sort of a spaghetti, and I don't know if it's all visible, but I'm just going to walk you through it. On the left-hand side is generation, and the right-hand side is consumption, basically. And left-hand side, you can see the yellow box on top is solar, point, uh, point oh 0.09 BTUs. Nuclear is 8.45, hydro is 2.45. So the boxes are not to scale, but the lines are. Okay, those thin lines are to scale. You'll see right away, right away it jumps out that the big black generation boxes are coal and petroleum. Okay, coal is 22 quads and petroleum is 37 quads. And these are basically carbon. Okay, now most of the petroleum is actually going to transportation. That's your diesel and your transportation. But ignoring that, most of the coal, in fact, uh, 90 plus percent of the coal is going to electricity generation, that box on the, on the top over there, which is using 39.97 quads in 2008. So electricity generation is dirty. It's based on coal, at least in the US. The second biggest component is natural gas, or which is closely followed by, uh, sorry, second is nuclear, closely followed by natural gas. If you take coal and natural gas, basically you're pumping carbon into the atmosphere like crazy, okay? So electricity is not clean, it's very dirty. That's the first big takeaway. The second big takeaway is actually absolutely bizarre. It blew my mind away to see this. Of the electricity generated, which is 40 quads, give or take, two thirds or more is wasted. Only 12.68 out of 40 quads, that orange stuff, the gray stuff is just waste. It's wasted in generation, it's wasted in transmission, and it's wasted in distribution. Now, transmission losses in the US are not very high, about 7%. But transmission losses in other countries are very high. In India, transmission losses are 25%, ranging up to 43% in some areas. Generation losses are because mechanical conversion of mechanical energy to, or nuclear energy to electricity is inefficient. Okay, you can approach 40, 50, 70%, but it's still not 100%. Even nuclear energy, which is kind of this energy of the future, um, all you're really doing is boiling water, okay? I mean, at the end of the day, you do all this crazy stuff and just boiling water. It's like a tea kettle on steroids, okay? So you're wasting a lot of energy. You're wasting huge amounts of energy as a gray bar. So those are two takeaways one from this picture. Now, I would encourage you to actually look at this picture and study it because you will get a tremendous understanding of the energy system in the U.S., which is similar to other countries, not, not the same. For example, in Japan and France, 70% comes from nuclear, okay? But then nuclear anagram is unclear. What do you do with the waste, okay? Here's the third fact. According to uh, testimony at the at, at a hearing on November 30th last year by the commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Energy, 15% of generating capacity in Massachusetts, okay? That's a lot of billions of dollars. Is needed fewer than 88 hours a year, okay? It's only pulled in at the absolute peak summer. Okay, less than 1% of the time. So you're building this enormous capacity and you're just not using it. It's crazy. This is what I mean by internal contradiction. This is what Marx was all upset about. Okay, and so am I. <laughs> so let's look at the structure of the system in terms of internal contradictions and external pressures. So to begin with, the technology is ossified, okay? The last clever stuff done in the grid was about 100 years ago, okay? After Tesla and Westinghouse and Edison, pretty much anybody with brains moved on to somewhere else, like cars. Interesting fact, Henry Ford used to work for Edison in Edison's electricity plant in Detroit, and then he quit and started a car manufacturing firm. Okay, it was still around. So smart guys left, okay? 
including Tesla, who died penniless in 1943, which is terrible. Okay. So, rising energy prices, we are seeing a diminishing of coal and natural gas, and so not coal, but gas, uh, well, oil and gas, diminishing resource. Peak oil means rising energy prices. That's an external pressure. Energy security, if all your secu oil is coming from uh, Middle Eastern countries where, you know, you're propping up dictatorships in order to get access to their oil or invading them, as the case may be, uh, it's not particularly secure. So that's an external pressure. Inefficiency, well, enough said. Global warming, okay. Carbon footprint is going to be a problem, is a problem, and once carbon taxes go in, which is absolutely unavoidable, it's a problem, okay? So we are seeing tremendous pressures on the grid from the outside and in internally. Is there a question over there? Or? I just had one question. Um, so most of those things are going up, but any efficiency, is that not coming down? Um, yes, it is. Inefficiency is coming down, but not as much as you'd like. So the question was, is inefficiency coming down? And I think it's because many of these inefficiencies are built into the way they produce electricity and built in the way to distribute things, how many splices you have, what kind of transformers you have, how long your lines are, things like that. The, the systemic inefficiencies that are very hard to actually get rid of. But yes, they are coming down. I'm just saying that inefficiency, you could live with inefficiency when the cost of the inputs is low. When the cost of inputs goes up, you can't tolerate that anymore. It's just going to cut it out. So what's going to bring it down? Okay. The structure of the energy, it goes up, and then something happens, it falls down. So what's going to bring it down? I believe seven things are going to change. So these are the technological push factors. The first one is renewable energy. Okay. More than a trillion dollars of investment is going into renewable energy around the world. Okay. Just you name it, solar, wind, geothermal. Google uh, is investing in uh, basically <laughs> putting in high explosives down a big pipe, you know, shooting down water and pulling up steam, okay, five kilometers down. Anywhere in the world you can shoot energy. If you, if, you, if, you next, if you throw a bomb eight kilometers down anywhere in the world, you'll get hot water. Okay, it's as simple as that. So all you need to do is dig a hole eight kilometers deep and you're done. Same thing with tidal. People are building these snakes which kind of float and then they go up and down and as they oscillate, you know, you just harvest energy from there. It's being done off this coast of Scotland, for example. Wind, of course, is, uh, is happening. Um, communication. So this is what, sort of at the heart of what the rest of the talk is going to be about. But if you can overlay the infrastructure with communication, you're able to actually know where the inefficiencies are. If, if, if you can tell the homeowner, look, if you don't turn off, the, if you turn off the AC right now, even though it's hot, we're going to give you $200. You can save $2 billion perhaps, okay? It's not necessary that everybody, so right now, I'll just give an example of this. ASHRAE is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, and they have policy 55, which says the set point in a building should be between 20 degrees and 26 degrees centigrade, and this middle point is 23 degrees. And every building in North America, if it's a AAA class office space, it's set point at 23 degrees throughout the year, okay? Right now it's 23 degrees. And pretty much, we measured it, I know, <laughs> okay? Uh, and in winter it's 23 degrees, in summer it's 23 degrees. Do you really care whether it's freezing outside, you're willing to wear a sweater? Because you want a sweater to come to work anyway. But ASHRAE will not permit you to put on a sweater in winter because they want to keep it at 23 degrees. If you can communicate in a big sign saying, look, if you guys are willing to wear a sweater to come to work in the middle of February, we'll give you a $100 bonus, you could save a lot of money. That's communication. Okay. Now, there's a lot more to it. I'm just giving you some pragmatic examples over here. Other thing that said, yeah. Yes. So just on the right hand side is rejected energy and energy services. Yes. What's rejected? Rejected energy basically means energy that's not used. And once you heat a car, car's engine by driving it, where's that heat going? It's okay. rejected. That's essentially the waste. That's waste. That's waste also. You could be putting a hamburger on it and you know having a <laughs> having a burger when you go drive home. I would recommend to you the uh, Radio Integral Cookbook. It's actually a real book. You just put your burger in aluminum foil, stick it in your car, drive home, it's done. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> I'm not making this up. And there's even stuff to do with roadkill, which I won't go into. <laughs> so, so, 
Okay, so energy flows right now are unidirectional. Basically, everything is coming down into your house. But if you had a solar cell, you could push it back out again. So that's another technology that's changing. Basically, so looking at diodes, you're looking at bidirectional energy flow. Storage is a big deal. You know, Bill Gates in a talk recently said something absolutely amazing because he'd gone and, qu gone and quantified it. He found that the total amount of energy storage available in the world today is equal to 10 minutes of worldwide production. Okay, that's it. So imagine that the amount of storage available for YouTube was 10 minutes of production. Okay, you can see that something is out of whack. So a lot of investment is going into storage in many different ways. Ultra capacitors, nano, nano bat batteries with nano molecules in them. Uh, these the rooms this size, absolutely vacuated with air, with these enormous big gyroscopes which are spinning like crazy. And you know, when you, when, at, by day when, the, when, you, when you have cheap energy, uh, by night when you have cheap energy, you spin it up, and by day you draw it down. Okay, people are doing that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so storage here basically means, uh, for the most part, storing electricity during off-peak time. Okay, natural gas, of course, is storage, but it's hard to create it, right? So, so, but whereas all of these other things are, are reversible reactions. One of the cheapest ways is to pump water up a dam. So it goes back up and it comes down again, right? So people do that as well. Compre compressing air is another thing you can do. So all these technologies for storage are coming in. Technological push factor, I'm just saying storage is coming. Okay. Um, metering is coming in, smart metering. Almost all of you by now have a smart meter on your house. I do. Uh, what you may not know is it forms a secure uh, WiMAX mesh to communicate with the uh, local utility to tell you exactly, to tell them exactly how much electricity you're using every few minutes or every few seconds. I don't know what this metering interval is. Now, we don't have access to the data as homeowners, but this is being collected, so that's happening. Uh, Plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Uh, this is a big deal, and the reason is very simple. The amount of energy you consume in a day is approximately 20 kilowatt hours, okay, for a typical North American home. 20 kilowatt hours. The Chevy Volt has a battery, and the capacity of that battery is 20 kilowatt hours. If you buy a Prius, uh, or one of these plug-in hybrid ones, they have four kilowatt hours. With the full all electric cars, basically a one day's worth of storage. Which means if some disaster struck and you cut off your electricity for one day, you'd be fine as long as you could use your car, plug it in. But the other interesting things open up over here, which is what happens if you have two neighbors and one has a lot of cars, electricity in the car, and the other one doesn't, or it's a hot day and you're home for whatever reason, you can use your car. You can actually use this storage. Okay, so PHEV is just another form of storage that you are buying on behalf of the electricity company, basically. Okay, so your, your uh, you know, debt to the car loan company is paying off the electricity bill. Okay, so that's a very interesting fact. Another part that becomes interesting is that you can actually carry energy in your car, and I can give you energy. I can say, oh, you're running short here. I'll give you one-tenth of my battery, and you drop it off in the driveway, and you can actually trade energy this way. So that's changing, and that's really a big deal. Uh, just to give you a sense of this, the amount of energy density in a lithium-ion battery in this laptop is greater than that of dynamite. Okay, you can look it up. Energy density, energy per cubic centimeter in a lithium-ion battery is greater than dynamite. Okay. Why they allow you to take it on a plane is beyond me. Okay. <laughs> and finally, high voltage DC and superconduction. They're actually building transmission lines between Philadelphia and New York, which are superconductors. They have no resistance whatsoever. They're cooled down to whatever it is, 240 Kelvin or whatever, to make it uh, work. So these are things that are changing. Uh, changing uh, the electrical grid, okay? And I, I won't have time to go in through all of them, and, and neither do you, but this is the bottom line. This is what it's going to look like in the end, at least my visualization. Instead of coal, we're going to have wind farms and solar farms, and hydro will stay there. And it, at these substations, those orange boxes you'll find next to them, I have shown a large battery. Um, these could be fuel cells. Uh, Ballard, which is a Canadian company based in Vancouver, uh, has got these large fuel cells. They are pretty big, and you can use them to produce electricity. Uh, recently, this is a company out of Silicon Valley, I forget the name right now, who said they've been powering eBay using a fuel cell as well. Um, so that's happening. Uh, the nice thing is you can store stuff at night and release it, so you can smooth out, modulate the energy so that 15% of capacity that you were wasting, you don't need to build out anymore because your peak to average ratio has gone down essentially. 
And uh, also in each house, we expect to have solar and wind. Why is it? Well, Ontario has the most aggressive and most forward-looking energy policy in the world, including Denmark and Germany. It's actually quite amazing. Okay, you, If you put a solar cell on your roof, you'll get 82 cents per kilowatt hour. Okay, it's a feed-in tariff. No matter how much you consume, every kilowatt hour you produce, you get 82 cents. If you work out the math, you get a loan from the bank for $30,000 and you put in a solar cell on your roof, you will actually make 16 to 22% rate of return on your money, which is way more than Scotiabank is going to give you. Okay, and I'm not making this up. Okay, you can go to sungarden.com or sungarden.ca, I don't remember, and they will work with you to put a stuff on, put, put the solar cell on your roof. Or you can go to St. Jacob's Farmer's Market on a Saturday, and next in Peddler's Village, there's a guy who's sitting there who will put up solar cell for you, $10, a kilowatt hour, sorry, ten dollars a watt, a kilowatt, ten dollars a watt. So a kilowatt is uh, ten thousand dollars, and uh, you know you can get money back. So you, you, I, I worked out the math. You basically, if you're going to stay in your house more than six years, you're going to make money hand over fist six years from now. You pay off in six years. So this is going to change what's happening here. You'll you'll see full page ads in the paper very soon. I'm predicting like next few weeks. You'll see ads from banks saying, "Come into our solar program. We'll take the, we'll, we'll put this on your roof, and you're going to get make money. It's like having a renter, except it's cheaper and the quieter." <laughs> so this is going to change the way Ontario rooftops are going to look like dramatically. In the same way that if you ride, drive through rural Germany, everywhere you find windmills. Why? It's the same thing. You, you know, it's cheap. You make money on it. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Right. So there are obviously issues with respect to this. Now there are people who will put in a complete off-grid system with local storage, lead acid local storage, not lithium ion. Lithium is too expensive right now. But uh, the re regulations are changing. In fact, the biggest problem the regulatory hurdle we have in Ontario right now is not the hydro company, it's uh, insurance. Because they're saying you're parking a BMW on your roof. <laughs> 30,000 bucks. What if somebody steals it when you're gone on vacation? <laughs> I mean, it's a non trivial problem. So, yeah, some of these things have to be, uh, they will be crossed because there's tremendous energy stored up, you know, at the pun. Okay. This is my prediction. The next decade will determine the structure of the grid in 2120. Okay. So, what the grid is going to look like in 100 years from 10 years from now. 110 years from now, look, we'll, we will decide what's going to happen. This, okay, what's going to happen? So, what are the problems? Okay, I've painted this vision, but there are lots of problems. Okay, I'm going to just mention a few things. One big problem is suddenly instead of having 150 sources of energy, okay, or 200 sources of energy, which are the coal plants and nuclear plants, you got tens of millions of sources. Everybody and their brother has got a solar cell on the roof, and that's exactly what the Palo Alto problem comes in, because they want to control it, but they don't know how to control 10 million sources. Okay, this is a big problem, okay? Because you want to maintain reliability, you want to maintain you know, what's called dispatchability, so it's a problem. Second thing is these sources are not constant bitrate, or constant energy rate, they're variable bitrate. Means they go up and down, you know, the sun goes away every day. <laughs> every night there's no sun, oops. You know, you just turned off your power plant, so what do you do? If the cloud goes over the face of the sun, you can lose up to 95% of your energy in about five seconds. If the wind stops blowing, you lose 100% of your energy in about a minute. So when you have these kinds of variable stochastic sources, the power engineers are just kind of wondering what to do because they, they've never been taught this stuff. Okay, They know how to do transformers and winding patterns and stuff like that, but you show them a stochastic source and say, we never learned the math for this one. So this is over-provision like crazy. So the rule is for every watt of solar, you need to put in five watts. Okay, so this build five watts. That's why it's so expensive. One of the reasons it's so expensive. Two-way flow is easy, but you know these are hard to get right. Okay, and I, I won't go into that too much. Non-utility players basically means you and I are utilities now. Just like we're putting a Wi-Fi access point in your house, you become an ISP. We're putting a solar cell, you become a utility provider. But you are not playing by the same rules as the utility providers play, which is whatever APIs they use for controllability, you're not really doing that. 
how do you get reliability? We have issues of multiple time scales, which means your control protection switching happens at 20 millisecond time scale. At the same time, we need to plan out transmission lines, which happens in a time scale of 15 to 20 years. Okay, if you want to put a line between here and Owen Sound, for example, to get wind energy from Owen Sound to here, just think about the regulatory hurdles to get land allocated to you along the way, along Route 6. It's a pain in the neck. Plus, so that happens in 15, 20 years. It's very expensive. At the same time, you have to deal with very short-term things. You know, the cloud came over the face of the, uh, you know, cloud cover moved into Ontario. All of our solar went away. What do we do? We've got to come somehow get stuff in from Quebec, for example. So that's a problem with that. Incentivization, how do you get people to do the right thing? Okay, to wear sweaters in winter, for example. And so expecting it to be 23 degrees throughout the year. Security, well, <laughs> it's the internet. Storage. When you put storage into any system, it causes delays. Okay, when you have delays in control, it's a mess because you have basically first order oscillatory behavior, then you put dampeners, you get slow surges. I mean, it's, it's control with delays is a pain in the neck and storage basically adds delays. So this is a well-known problem in control. It's a difficult problem. In, in addition, instead of the Supply changing over time, the demand is also changing over time, right? Because now what you're doing is you're putting in like peak load pricing. Oops, your price just went up because it's 8 o'clock instead of 7.59, right? That's what peak load pricing is coming into us. Uh, uh, this November, I believe, we're going to have peak load pricing or whenever it is. So suddenly your demand is variable as well because people will all turn off the dishwashers when the price goes up. And so suddenly the demand sinks. So the demand which is very predictable suddenly changing as well. And the other thing is resources are remote. What do I mean by that? In order to replace one megawatt of electricity from solar, you need 110 acres of land. Okay. You're not going to be able to uh, do that in your backyard anytime soon. Okay. So these renewable energy sources are primarily going to be in the rural countryside. But that's not where the supply, you know, the demand is. The so supply is in the countryside, and the demand is in Waterloo and in Toronto. So how do you get it from here to there? Okay, it's not obvious. Maybe use cars to drive it in. And finally, we have the legacy. We have 110 years of crud, okay? Or wherever it is, you have to basically deal with that. So these are all problems. <laughs> and uh, if you go read the reports written by the commissioners in charge of electricity, or you know, we talk to Hydro One people and so on, this is what they look like. So what can we do? So now that I have a few minutes to talk about my... <laughs> So I think, so this is end of part one. Part one says things are going to change in a big way, and there's nothing that you and I can do other than to watch it. Okay, I mean, at least it's going to happen. I can predict it's going to happen. I'm pretty confident of that. Part two is we know something about the Internet. And guess what? What we know with the Internet matches the grid. So I'm going to go through some similarities and differences, and then the end, I'll sort of paint a research hypothesis. What can we do? Okay, so what are the similarities? Interestingly enough, the internet and the grid historically started out the same way. It was bottom up at first. You know, people put up their own little uh, lands, okay, or there was this van, but most people had their own ethernet lands, and they said, let's hook it up. You know, we kind of grew up from the bottom. In the same way, people started building their own electricity grids because there was, there was a windmill, there was a, sorry, there was a water source nearby. In 1881, the first generator generation was put up in Niagara Falls. So, it's a DC generator actually in 1881. This is before the grid, right? This is just some guy wanted to run some machines. He got some DC machines from Edison, so he put up a DC machine, a DC generator in Niagara Falls. So it was bottom up, and then slowly they said, if you diversify our sources, we can actually get the power of diversity. So let's use a grid. So it was bottom up, and then top down it came. So we must have a grid. We must have a national grid. We must have this. So in the same way, the internet grew up from the bottom and then became a top-down initiative once the politicians got into the picture. They're both vast. I mean, they're everywhere, right? Pretty much. Um, especially with cell phones today, internet is everywhere because you can carry it in your pocket, you get 3G or satellite phone. They're heterogeneous, right? The electricity grid you already showed you different kinds of sources, different kinds of users. It, they're both critical to society, and they're both ossified. And the internet, the core of the internet is stuck in 1973. Okay, and it's never going to get out of 1973. Okay, and the core of the electricity grid is stuck in 1892. <laughs> okay, I mean it's, 
if you see a picture of a t transmission line or a generator or whatever from 1895 and you look at 1995, it's the same thing. You could guy somebody who's dead 100 years, bring him back to life and say, work on this electricity substation. He'd know exactly what to do. Nothing has changed. Incidentally, if you get somebody who died in 1950 and you brought them to your kitchen, they would know exactly what to do other than the microwave. Nothing has changed. Kitchen technology is also ossified, by the way. So it's fascinating how many things are ossified. Uh, <laughs> I could go into a whole riff on that, but I won't. They're hierarchical, okay? The, the transmission core is actually a mesh, okay? O for obvious reasons, but the distribution is basically tree-like because we don't really care about redundancy, whereas in the core we care about redundancy. And the mesh-like core uses its own technology. We use high-voltage transmission, all right? And the distribution is low-voltage. It's probably like, it's, it's in the thousands of volts rather than the hundreds and thousands of volts. So in the same way, in the internet core, we use MPLS, right? Nobody uses IP, okay? We want to strip out all the headers and do something fast and smooth and sleek, but in the access network, we use IP. So we have tree-like access network. We have hubs and very little redundancy. So it's an example of this. This is the US transmission grid. I couldn't find a one for Canada. So this is the transmission grid as of 2007, I believe. Uh, you can see what it looks like. And this is the internet uh, density of IP, ac IP addresses. It is roughly similar. It's pretty much what you expect. Where there are people, there's electricity, and there's information. Okay, one flows energy, one flows information. They are very similar in that respect. The varying degrees of control. Now you think of the grid as being very much under control, but actually what you plug into your grid at home is not controlled. You can plug in anything you want as long as you obey the API, which is you know, two pins or three pins, that's it. As long as you obey the API and you don't overdraw your current limit, you're fine. You can plug whatever you want. That's what allows innovation to proceed. In the same way as IP is a narrow waste, the three pin plug is a narrow waste of the electrical grid. Okay, And, and, and the control beyond that is very, very loose. Uh, in fact, the internet has more control on the edges than the electrical grid, uh, just in, in some ways. There's storage in both networks. The storage in the uh, uh, grid is far less than what you'd want. And there's a simple API to both of them, right? To write an app on the, on the electrical grid, you build a toaster, <laughs> okay? And that's an app. You can do whatever you want, okay? And, well, you know how to build apps in the internet. And they both use, they're basically solving the same problem. It's a bunch of distributed demand sources, demands from people, and the distributed sources, you know, generators and so on, you want to match the two. So, and so the resource matching problem, it's a standard resource allocation problem, and you do whatever is necessary. You build a Steiner tree, and you do whatever you need to do to get things going. And finally, or well not finally, this is balance of centralization and decentralization. We want to centralize some things and then decentralize it. For example, and just focus on just this one thing, in the internet, AT&T and Verizon and these big guys provide long-haul transmission, and then they attach to tier twos, which provide basically uh, access and aggregation. They don't really want to give service to every endpoint. In the same way, Hydro One connects hundreds of uh, local distribution companies like Waterloo North Hydro. Waterloo North is not generating electricity. They're just providing you access. They are your ISP or ESP, if you want, an electricity service provider. And they are decoupled from the backbone, which is the transmission. So the same kind of two-stage things are going on. There are differences. Okay, one big difference is electricity doesn't have headers. <laughs> okay, I mean it's kind of silly to state it, but it's really very, very profound because headers carry two things that are important. One is type, and one is destination. So. On the internet, I can say this packet is of type X, whatever that type is. And you know it could be a TCP packet, UDP packet, whatever. I can put that in the header, so I know what to do with it. In electricity, electron is an electron. Okay. Similarly, in the internet, I can say I'm going to send I'm going to send a packet down this wire, and I'm going to put the MAC address of that abscess, of that host over there, and it's going to go to that one host. I cannot address a single light bulb, right? So if somebody is studying in that corner. I have to send electrons to all the lights over here, right? Because they're not addressable. The only way I can control them is to have one circuit per bulb, which is too expensive, right? So this addressability fundamentally allows efficiency. If only communication in the internet was broadcast, you'd be in trouble, which is why Wi-Fi sucks, okay? Because that's it's broadcast. And so everybody gets everything, and so it's not very efficient besides interference. So that's one difference. Second difference is, as I mentioned earlier, electricity generation is primarily one way, 
uh, whereas internet is more more or less two way. So we have a difference over there. The time scale of control in internet is within seconds, okay, you or within milliseconds to seconds, depending on what kind of control you're talking about. If you're talking about scheduling, it's in the nanoseconds. If it's a, a round trip a flow control, it's milliseconds and so on and so forth. Whereas in the in, in, things happen much more slowly on the grid. If you want to bring up a nuclear reactor, it takes two days to two weeks, depending, okay, on you know what's going on. Uh, you never have to wait two to two or three weeks to bring up a source. Uh, on the internet. You can typically do it within seconds. And then here's a very interesting difference. If you have a fiber optic link between here and Owen Sound and you want to go from, you know, a 100 meg link to 1 gig link, you just change out the lasers at both ends and you start sending more lambdas, you're done. Okay. You can't do that at the grid. Okay. You, long haul transmission is a constrained resource and you can't actually add more capacity to it. Now, with superconductors, presumably you can do that, but without the superconductors, you're basically stuck with whatever you have. So you need to put in more wires, more copper, whatever it is. The internet is uh, less predictable because you have flash crowds, whereas the, um, uh, the grid is very predictable. You can pretty much guess what's going to happen. So these are some kind of differences. So the bottom line is I think of the electrical grid as being a content distribution network for a single video stream. It's a video stream because it's continuous generation going on. And we want to actually distribute this. So, so let's take the case of somebody <laughs> trying to grab electricity onto the car and driving it to somebody else. It's like downloading a file onto your memory stick and going and giving it to your friend. Okay, that's the same exact thing as downloading electricity. Okay, and it's a single video stream because there are no types. It's all the same. So, which means that we can start applying the same tricks we use for CDNs for the electricity grid. Okay, and we'll come to that in just a minute. So, this sort of concludes the part two of my talk, and I'll just pause and take any questions at this point. Okay, so let me move on. So what I'm going to do is to make this hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that the research and technologies developed by internet, by internet research in the last 40 years can be used to green the grid. So it's in green. Okay. So, it's a hypothesis because I haven't proved it. I'd like to spend the next several years proving it, but I'm going to give you some taste of why I think it's true, and then you know, I'll sort of conclude. So I must state that this is not the same as these two other things. I'm not saying reduce electricity usage for internet data centers. Now, it's great to reduce electricity usage anywhere, including internet data centers. But let's face it, it's only using 1.5% of all electricity produced. Okay, It's not a big deal. Heating and cooling uses 40% of all energy, 20% for commercial, 20% for domestic. Okay, So if you affect that, you're far better off than affecting the data center. Now, for Google, internet data center is a big deal. But for the rest of the world, you know, basically, I don't care. Okay, you could burn all the electricity you want. You're really not doing much harm. But every single building, every single restaurant that keeps its door wide open in summer with the AC blasting, now they are a big deal, okay, because there are millions of them and they're all completely messed up. So we need to figure out incentives to make them do the right thing. A second thing that people have talked about in green networking is to use the internet as a communication overlay. Now, I mentioned this already, smart metering. And yes, that's a great idea. But it seems to me it doesn't go as deep as one would like. You can go far deeper by actually reformulating the grid in terms of internet research, as I'll show you in the next few slides. So one idea is local matching. So I said if the, if the grid is a, a CDN, content distribution network, what is it that corresponds to delay? Now, what we want to do in a CDN is to reduce the delay, right? We want to get the content done as fast as possible. Well, the longer the electricity travels on a wire, the more transmission losses there are because you know the the you, know, you have I squared R is the heating of the wire. So each kilometer the electricity travels on the wire, you're wasting and uh, wasting wasting electricity. So minimizing delays is more effective to minimizing transmission loss. As I showed you earlier, these losses are fairly fairly large. So what we want to do is to perhaps use peer-to-peer cooperative caching to reduce losses. How does this work? OK, so you'll take your Android phone and stick it in your car, and it forms a wi wireless mesh network with all the other Android phones in everybody else's car. And they talk to each other and say, hey, you know, how much electricity do you have? This is how much I have. You want to swap? 
Okay, and you have this chit chat going on, and at the end of the day, they control the appropriate diodes and so on, and the electricity flows out from the car through the plug into the substation and down to somebody else. And at the end of the month, you get a bill that says you just made 200 bucks because your neighbors all wanted your electricity. Okay, not bad. Just because you happen to work near a hydroelectric power plant and they have lower rates over there, you can bring electricity to your neighbors in your car. And you could do this. I mean, this is technologically feasible today. Okay, so we have to just use the same ideas in cooperative caching that we all know about, which we know about and the grid people are clueless about. Okay. Tomography is the determination of the traffic matrix from a number of observations. You know, you have CAT scans. CAT is just computer-aided tomography. So you take a bunch of X-ray images and you figure out backwards. You do a sparse matrix inversion. You figure out where everything is. In the same way, the internet tomography, you look at a bunch of aggregate points and you figure out from the aggregate flows what the traffic matrix was. From some source S to some destination D, how many bits were sent over some period of time. So right now, maybe we can do the same thing with grid usage. We can just measure substations use. Instead of doing smart metering per home, is there a way for us to figure out invert the sparse matrix and not have to meter everybody. Maybe you can do it through tomography. So I'm just throwing this out. I have no idea. I mentioned this to somebody from Hydro One and they were not immediately aghast. They said, oh, maybe we could do this. And they actually are going to give me access to the data. So I'll know what you guys are doing. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, solar and wind are stochastic sources, available bitrate sources. Now, one thing that the internet people have done is to model stochastic sources like crazy. I mean, I can point to probably 200 papers on, on or maybe more, 2,000 papers on variable bitrate sources, how to model them using any number of uh, techniques, uh, you know, Markov modulated Poisson processes, you know, auto ARN models, auto regressive N models. You name it, right? And the big question is the internet model is always the same. If I have 100 BBR sources going to the link, what is the probability they're going to overflow the link? Okay, should I accept them or not? The exact analogy of this is this. You, you, you build a hotel. It has 100 rooms in it. Okay, there are 100 rooms in it. And the technician comes from the phone company and says, how many dialogue phones do you want? Now, imagine this is before cell phones. Right, so you have to choose how many lines you have. If you put one line in for each guest room outbound, they can always call out from the hotel, right? That's great, but then it's expensive. If you put in just one, it's probably too low. What number do you use? It's workload dependent, right? It's workload dependent, and that's the same problem over here. Oops, what did I do now? Ah. Uh, why did it go away? Or did I move this? Oh, the wire came out, maybe. Ah, it was a mechanical problem. <laughs> so under what combination, under what conditions is the sum of these VBR sources uh, greater than some value, okay? Uh, so the probability that sum exceeds x should be greater than 0.9, then it's 5 nines reliability. So Hydro One operates on 5 nines. So they want to say that the base load in the province is whatever, you know, 200, 200 megawatts, 250 megawatts. So how many sources do we need to put in? How many solar, how much wind, so that with very high probability, the sum of these sources exceeds the base load. Okay, that's the answer they want to get. And it's workload dependent, and it's stochastic, and they don't know how to do it. And you know, we, I think we can, we know how to do it. Now remember, this is very, very different from the kind of thinking you do to say, let's turn off the routers and not being used. It's very different from saying, Let's use the internet as a communication overlay. It's got nothing to do with communication whatsoever. It's using internet thinking rather than the internet itself. Delay to networking basically says, look, I have this USB stick in my pocket. Or I, I used to have it in my pocket. I don't know what happened to it. Casey has it, I guess. So let's just pretend. Oh, yeah, here we go. This internet stick, it has, you know, 30, gig whatever, 8 gigabytes. I'll just make it up. Maybe it's not. And um, it has eight hours of movie. I put it in my pocket. I walk home. I have eight hours of movie. Okay. Well, maybe you can carry energy like this. You you take your laptop. You know, take the battery, stick it in your pocket, go home, and you can run your dishwasher. Okay. So how do you do that? So this is a very interesting question. Every time I click on a link, and I'm using Google, assuming I'm using Google, you guys know what I did. You know what I clicked on and where I went to. So you kind of com computing the, 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 the page rank of the, of, of, you know, sorry, not the page rank, but the, uh, you know, basically you're computing a profile on me. What happens when I turn a light switch on and off? 
okay? That's a click as well, right? Now, imagine the following thing. Let's say I can harvest the electricity clicks and somebody is going to turn their AC on on a hot summer day when the peak load is very high and everybody is, this newspaper and TV is broadcasting, please don't use your AC, this idiot does it anyway. Okay, what do we know about this person? They are rich. <laughs> suck, you know, suck it to them, you know, charge them a lot of money because they don't care, okay? Or maybe the teenage kid doesn't care. But whatever it is, you know, they're indifferent to price. So the demand elasticity they have in economic terms is very low. They're not elastic. They have inelastic demand. If it's hot, they're going to turn the AC off no matter what. These people also drive Hummers, okay? <laughs> Probably on the wrong side of the road as well. But this kind of information is very valuable, okay? to companies who want to harvest information. So imagine streams of electricity clicks coming in from 100 million endpoints into some data source. You can imagine the data mining possibilities are out there. So people like uh, Ashraf who are database people should probably view this as, what can we do with this data? What can we do, uh, you know, hopefully for the social good? I don't know about Google. <laughs> okay. Now, how do you get somebody to turn the light off? It's a game theoretic problem. You have to make it incentive compatible. You have to say, look, if you turn the light off, you save money, okay? So assuming you can do this, maybe this mechanism design problem. Now we know how to try and get people to not download too many movies, okay? You have a bandwidth limiter or some kind of thing from Sandwine that says if you use too much, you're gonna delay things. Okay, so this kind of thinking about the game theoretic modeling of the negative impacts Okay, a tragedy of the commons um, is very important. It's a game theoretic model. Okay, again, the kind of ideas you developed in the internet can be applied over here. Any kind of blackout, which means you know you lost, you, your demand was greater than supply for extended period of time, means more than five minutes, means you have a blackout or a brownout where your phase goes down from 50 hertz, 60 kilohertz, you can go to 50 hertz or whatever. That's the same as network congestion on the internet. So essentially, all the kinds of distributed control algorithms that have been developed on the internet for network congestion can be used uh, over here. To give us an example of this, what's the electricity grid's analog of TCP? Okay, so TCP says, if I see a packet loss, it must be me. Okay, it's the uh, very, uh, I don't know the psychoanalytic term for this, but <laughs> self-blaming view of the world. Oops, it must be me, sorry. Now, it's a very sorry behavior. Analog for this in electricity grid is if you overstep a limit, your circuit breaker trips off and you're not allowed to use anymore. But that's very coarse. It's very coarse. It says if you draw more than 20 amps, oops, the fuse went off, then you go and do something manually and you kind of do it. Because the equivalent of FTP is a short circuit. <laughs> okay. That's the equivalent of FTP. Give me everything right away. That's your short circuit. We don't want to prevent that. So just like your rate limiters, we have circuit breakers. You want to make it a little bit more graceful. You want to probe and say, maybe the substation has more energy. I can use more right now to charge my car. Maybe it doesn't. I'm going to back off. So we want to have this modulated additive increase, multiplicative decrease approach to energy consumption rather than just saying, well, I'm going to get five amps. And I get, if I can't get more than five amps, I'm going to shut down. OK. so. There's some interesting analysis that needs to be done over here. And finally, simulation. So we really, I talked to a bunch of people and I said, how do you decide how much grid power you need, how much solar, how much wind, depending on the, you know, the stochastic vari variations and so on and so forth. The answer is, well, it's seat of the pants. There really doesn't seem to exist any simulation. And I've talked to a bunch of people about this, including the, uh, the green energies, energies are at uh, Google a bit while, and that was a while ago. But uh, maybe you guys have it now. But at, as far as I know, there is no simulator. So one of the things I'm trying to do is to build a continental level simulation of, uh, let's say, Brent, North America. You know, simulate cloud cover, simulate wind movement, simulate, uh, you know, 200 cities and the variable demands, simulate the movement of cars and transmission lines. We know exactly where the transmission lines are. I already showed you a figure. That's a downloadable data set that you can download and run it. So I have a student who's going to be working with me exactly on this. And we're going to try and simulate uh, North America and see what happens. We can help us as a planning tool. Okay. Again, this is using internet style thinking. So I'm just about running out of time. So I'm going to give you three thoughts. First one, the decade 2010 to 2020 will decide the grid of 2120. Okay. That, 
my great grandkids will, will be will be using and probably yours too the internet approximately equal to the grid it's not the same okay we don't have headers we don't have a bunch of different things and i believe that 40 years of internet research could should may help uh, at least i'm going to try doing it for the next uh, some years so with that i'll end and i'll have any questions any more questions that come up So I was thinking about these uh, incentives in Ontario. You know, you get some rate for solar and some rate for wind. And I, I noticed that the, the rate for wind was much lower uh, than solar. And it seems like that's that's just an incentive that you know makes it economical to build X, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas in Ontario, maybe Y is is the choice because you know it, you get more wind uh, electricity per per dollar invested yeah, than yeah. solar it mm -hmm. seems kind of i don't know a bit wasteful to to use the the money on building solar panels when you could be wind building wind turbines do you have a comment to that so uh, i'm the wrong person to answer that i mean i'm not setting policy initiatives i'm just telling you that policy initiatives have an effect and that clearly is borne out by the fact that you looked into it so uh, what should be the modeling? Uh, my, my, my answer would be this. I think it's an interesting research problem, from an academic perspective at least, to understand the incentive structure of a particular policy and what actions can be expected as a consequence of that policy. And uh, you know, I think we should kind of play it out and see what happens and you know, say predict that this is what's going to happen and see if our predictions are correct. So that, that's what we should be doing. I think uh, you're your simulation here is seems like it's something that that is uh, likely in the future of grid to be uh, very financially lucrative. Yes. In a sense, if you yes. can sort of identify these points where you know energy prices are are expected to fluctuate a lot in the right. grid, then right. you know you build your your gyroscopes uh, there. Yeah. And, That's and right. You sort of arbitrage the, the energy yes market. yes there should be financially lucrative I, I, that's why i said i don't know what google is doing right now because if anything is financially lucrative and has to do with information you guys have your fingers all over it so <laughs> i would not be at least bit surprised to know there's a simulation going on in you know one million computers in the middle of nebraska or whatever uh any questions for someone on vc before uh they get cut off So, uh, like the whole system, it seems like uh, geared towards uh, like more like peer-to-peer -peer incentives. So it becomes like much more sources everywhere, yes. right? And we're thinking about how to give incentives for this sort of usage. Yes. But once you put like much more power into the nodes mm -hmm. of the system. Like there is a question about uh, abuse and control, security, this sort of thing. So if I have incentive to give something back, I can try to game the system so yeah. that uh, you see what I mean, right? So absolutely. It, and you're, you're absolutely right. And that's let me restate my thesis. I'm saying that the grid is going to change, not because of these kinds of issues, but because of carbon footprint, because of uh, transmission losses, you know, global warming, things like that. When it's changing and becoming more distributed, these issues will come up. And my claim is that the things that we've learned from internet research ought to help us model and analyze these things. I'm not saying that these problems don't exist. They do exist. They have to be solved. And I think that internet engineers have something to contribute over here. OK, so uh, basically just another thing to keep in mind. Yeah, remember I showed you this. Uh, yeah, so where did I go? Let me see. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, one more question somewhere else. So do you have any recommendations about uh, places where we can learn more information about the grid, how it exists today, or the structure of the grid, yeah. like books, websites, whatever? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there are um, uh, 
So the, the, I have a website called ISS for you, and I really should have put it up on my screen. If you just search for ISS, the number 4E, that stands for Information Systems and Science for Energy. And that's the research group that I'm leading with uh, Professor Catherine Rosenberg at uh, University of Waterloo. And uh, we have a, a section there called Resources. And in that, it's a, it's a wiki. And in the Resources section, you'll find links to all sorts of things uh, that have come up. Uh, uh, including some speeches by Bill Gates and uh, some projects at Berkeley, for example, which has been focusing on this. There are uh, some books available. Uh, probably the best one on the internet grid is called, I think, uh, Electrical Grid Concepts by Alexandra von Meyer. Uh, but if you send me email, I'll be happy to send you a pointer to that uh, book. Yeah, you can. But there are there are books available, and uh, there's a free book you can download called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. Uh, that's from a professor at Cambridge whose name escapes me right now. That's also really worth uh, reading as well. The link to Professor Keshav's uh, project site is in the abstract if anyone needs to follow up later. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, so these very much seem to be first world solutions to this, but like say carbon footprint in that, you know, North America isn't the only problem. So how does how do we, like, does this abstract into third world situations at all? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my focus for the last seven years has been on rural development in, in developing countries. And what got me started in energy was to realize that the biggest problem in villages is not the lack of communication, but the lack of energy. All right. And the lack of clean energy. You know, cooking done is done with cow dung cakes in most of India, which is an absolute horrible uh, source of particulate matter. Uh, causes uh, all sorts of diseases, plus those particles settle on the glaciers in the Himalayas and cause the glaciers to melt, causing floods, right? So what you need to do is to basically get them clean grid, cheap grid, solar, wind, okay? So these issues of local distribution, local generation are not just over here, these are worldwide. And if you can set up a, uh, in fact, in India, it's taking a big lead in solar for um, LED lighting systems. So you charge it by, by day, and then you have the light go on at night using LEDs. It's a, it's a kind of a tamper-proof, foolproof system that uh, is being used in India. It's being used in Bolivia, uh, Peru, places like that. So uh, these issues come up. Now, the bigger issues I'm outlining over here are relevant to the North American context, because that's what I'm talking about right now. I'm delivering a similar speech in, in India in uh, three weeks, and uh, it will be slightly different. But obviously, my focus is going to be on more local issues. But there is a big uh, relationship between the spread of electrical energy and uh, rural health, actually. So, uh, so I think there are, there are those kind of issues become relevant. Now, you can say, what is the role of internet in this? Same thing, stochastic sources, right? How many villagers need to have sun and wind in order for us to get the baseline electrical load for that village, even if they're off-grid? We need to know that how much storage should be put. What is the sizing of the lead acid cells? And if you over capacity, if you over provision it, it costs you too much, right? It costs you too much. So you, maybe you can have a siren system that says everybody turn off your whatever it is right now because the grid is going to explode in your face. <laughs> so I mean these kinds of things, you know, may sound stupid, but uh, the early warning system for the tsunami in South India was actually loudspeakers connected to a cell phone, which got a text message saying, you know, run for your life. And people, people yeah, it worked. Loudspeakers work really well. When you live in a dense environment, it works really well. So uh, these issues are not far from my mind, but uh, they're not in this particular presentation. Yes. So, uh, like, I'm thinking, like, so we have the problem, basically, with the current system, right? Yeah. And, like, this seems like a pretty radical change. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm thinking about how cost effective would be like changing the whole system comparing to maybe like finding a couple things that are like really, really bad in the current system. Yeah. Let's say yeah. like maybe doing one thing, like like relatively simple thing, like, I don't know, maybe like adding the storage, like massive storage points somewhere, right? Yeah. So maybe it'll fix the current system so it'll work like another hundred years. Yeah. It could be like more cost effective than changing the whole system. So all the research that I've done into this, and I'm by no means an expert, uh, leads me to believe that uh, the system is really at this creaking obsolescence stage, okay, where the people running it really know it's going to collapse, and they're really scared, 
and they really need help. I mean, why else would a monopoly come to university and say, please help us? You know, they're, they're worried that the whole thing is going to just, as far as I can make out, they really want to seem to want to make the change. I'll give you an example of this, which is absolutely amazing. In Ontario, there are 2 million wooden power poles. Okay, there are 2 million of them. Each of them costs $1,200 to replace. So it's $2.2 billion in just these wooden power poles. Most of them are more than 35 years old and their lifespan is 35 years. <laughs> okay, so which ones do you change? Now it turns out the people at Waterloo are doing research on determining which poles to change by taking a helicopter flying over them and looking at the amount of surface rot from image analysis and determining that with high probability these poles are bad. Okay. Other people are using ultrasound measurements. They have a ring of eight ultrasonic transducers. They put it on the pole and then they compute the essentially a CAT scan except it's done with sound and they figure out the internal structure of the wood and tell you whether it's going to be uh, falling in the next five years or not. Okay. So these are the kinds of technologies which are coming in. So the, to answer your point, systemic change seems to be inevitable. Okay, It's being recognized by every energy authority in the, on the planet. Okay, So I may be wrong, but hopefully not all of them are wrong at the same time. Maybe they're better than economists Okay, who tend to be universally wrong. <laughs> uh, I should say the diversity in opinion among, among economists uh, doesn't seem to exist. Whereas with the power engineers, that lack of diversity may be less. I have too many negatives in my sentence. <laughs> but you get, I hope you get the point. Uh, and the second thing is even small things cost a lot, right? Even the poles cost, you know, like $2 billion. Even a small, small nuclear reactor is $5 billion. There's tremendous amounts of money in this. Tremendous amounts of money in this. To change the infrastructure, it's 100 years of infrastructure. 100 years of hundreds of millions of people paying hundreds of dollars a month, every month, for the system. You know, it all went somewhere. <laughs> so, so basically, you think that changing the system, like pretty much uh, doing like complete overhaul of the system, in the long term, it would be more cost effective than yeah. maybe fixing a couple like really big pains of point right now. Sorry, if you look at smart grid, that's what people are saying. Okay, and I'm inclined to believe them. Okay. I can't say it for myself, but from, 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 what, from, from what I've heard, that's what I'm hearing. Uh, yeah. Um, have, you, have you thought about um, using existing hydropower plants? They seem like they are becoming more valuable as you face in more uh, renewable intermittent sources. Right, right, absolutely. Because you can, you can fairly fast uh, scale up the output from, you know, scale the output of, of a hydroelectric plant. Yeah, but once you re I mean, there are a certain number of turbines. It's yes, very yes. hard to add more the, capacity. Yes, you can ramp up over five to ten minutes. You can spin up a new turbine. And that's why this what's called pumped hydroelectric storage is a big deal. You can take water and pump it back up yeah. the dam. But it seems that uh, you don't even have to pump the water up. You just don't run those when you have, uh, uh, you know, when the wind is blowing, basically. Yeah. I guess there is some percentage of your energy mix uh, that is sort of, if you are above this level in terms of uh, hydroelectricity, uh, then you can sort of add more yeah. uh, intermittent sources without having to worry. Uh, that, that's right. So the, the, what the power engine is called the base load and then the peak load. So the base load is what you want to meet all the time. And typically, it's met today by coal and nuclear and hydro, because these are long-running sources, and that's okay. And then you can take the care of the extra deltas from, from wind and solar, for example. So, um, uh, yes, so I agree with you that, you know, uh, we, want, we want to develop hydro. Uh, I, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but North American large-scale hydro is at the 80% stage or something like that, in that ballpark in terms of usage. All Basically, all rivers have been dammed. Yeah, okay. uh, but, uh, yeah, so one thing here is, uh, adding more turbines to existing dams. Yeah, yeah. and they're doing this. So Niagara is building additional turbines. You know, it's coming on stream, I think, next two, three years. And the other interest is in micro-hydro, which is, uh, you know, you have a stream running through, just put a small generator, which is a, you know, four, five, four, a few hundred watts even, 
right? Uh, can you and, and and that is uh, combined with storage that makes a difference, right? You can take your I mean people are putting uh, solar cells on backpacks. That's really tiny. Right, the same kind of tiny micro hydro can also be built, is being built and deployed. And so if you live by a stream, you could potentially power your house from there. So yeah. The, the problem with micro hydro tends to be uh, it's a mechanical systems. The turbines run out, wear out, you know, they get clogged with algae and dust and who knows what. You know, it's pretty gross. Have you tried cleaning out your bathroom sink anytime? <laughs> it's similar to that, but worse. <laughs> So not, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you could put a micro turf. <laughs> now, if you're bald, it's much better. Let me assure you of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you could generate. I mean, people have talked about you know putting a tiny wind turbine and you know holding out of your car and charging a cell phone from that, right? Uh, there was a proposal about three years ago by conceptual artists, so please take it at conceptual artist level, of putting turbines on the middle of the New Jersey turnpike in New Jersey. And they kind of estimated that just the wind, the sheer wind from the two cars moving in opposite directions will cause the turbines to spin pretty fast. And that can generate enough electricity for, I don't know what, something interesting. So. Uh, you know, so yeah, you could, you could, all these kinds of harvesting can be done. Uh, I think that it will be done. You know, once electricity cost goes to, let's say it goes from 10 cents a kilowatt hour to 50 cents a kilowatt hour you know, in two years from now, you will be facing, you know, half the lights will be turned off. I visited Bell Labs in, uh, uh, Bell Labs is where I used to work, and I visited them in, I can't remember, early 2000 something. Uh, was it, I don't know. And these guys, this is before they got bought by Alcatel. This Lucent was saving money by turning off every other la uh, 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 light. Every other light thing was turned off to save electricity, okay? And that was uh, Bell Labs, okay? Uh, if, if electricity goes up by a factor of five, you'll see that happening everywhere. So, and these kinds of harvesting will become popular. It's a question of, you know, money talks. And right now everything is cheap and it's going to change. So I guess one more um, liability of the current centralized grid is its vulnerability to uh, deliberate attacks. Yes. Uh, and if you build your, your grid simulator, I'm sure you could find like one spot that you could go and cut a wire. and. and yeah, with yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, eight years ago, I did some research where I identified the 500 data centers where 80% of the internet traffic comes from. I could identify the uh, the IP address and, with a little bit of work, the geographical location as well. And one of the questions I got asked was, "Aren't you giving people a map of exactly where to bomb?" <laughs> so I never published that work. So will this <laughs> will this change with the uh, the smart grid? The yeah, distribution so generally means resilience. That's a standard rule in computer science. Uh, any last questions from uh, VC participants? All right, I guess uh, thank you very much for coming by, Professor Keshav. Thank you.